after a deep dive into HTTP2. And uh, you can, by the way, you can ask the same questions after the talk that you asked about HTTP2. And then we can, we can move to the discussion zone. So, by the way, you know, today is the Independence Day in the United States of America, where, the, where our next speaker came from. So you can give a big round of applause. Straight from Houston, Texas. Nick Shadrin, Nginx. All right. Woo! All right, thank you. So welcome to the second part of the HTTP talks today. And the second part is the talk about HTTP 3 this new version of the protocol. Funny thing is, when I saw the questions there, um, it's, uh, it's interesting that when you will be thinking about the questions, you might be thinking about the same ones you asked for the previous talk. They might still apply for this one. But anyway, let's, uh, let's go and see what we, can, uh, what we can talk about. First, a few bits about me. I am living in Texas, that's right. And uh, I worked for Nginx since around 2014. Um, right now, it's, um, it, it is a, a, a nice and interesting company, and um, um, basically I continue to speak about, uh, speak about um, HTTP protocols, about all the features at the events like High Load, and I really enjoy this conference. Um, thank you so much for hosting us here in, in, in Belgrade. And um, let's, let's go and see what, what we can talk about. At, uh, at first, I will talk about the, uh, the history about the protocols. It is uh, somewhat similar to what you saw uh, previously with the additions of uh, the reasoning of having the, uh, the new protocol developed. And the different thing is we'll look at the market at how the protocol is used today. Obviously, we'll look at the features and benefits of how it works, all, all the things like that. And uh, I will um, show a few bits of configuration and how to use the HTTP3 protocol in your networking and uh, how to configure it uh, properly with Nginx. Of course, uh, nothing in the protocols like that is uh, very, um, uh, is n nothing is always beautiful. There is a, a bunch of issues and problems there. We'll look at that uh, towards the end of the presentations and then we'll try to see if that actually makes sense for us to, uh, to use this kind of protocol. So, the basics. The basics of all HTTP uh, protocols 1, 2, and 3, they have the same idea and the same, uh, uh, the same concepts of the request and response. This kind of um, semantics, they stay through all the protocols. Uh, you still have the, uh, the concept of, um, of request, of headers, methods, um, the, uh, the protocol versioning, the response codes, uh, all kinds of things. This, this is still there. And that um, was going on since around 1996 uh, so with HTTP 1.0, and it still, uh, still goes on through all the versions of the protocol. Uh, a couple of things uh, for, uh, about the history um, that is uh, different from the previous speaker on HTTP2 is I want to mention the timeline and the differences in uh, the timeline in the development of the new versions of the protocol. Between HTTP 1.1 and HTTP2, there was more than a decade of uh, uh, developing that new protocol version. However, the uh, HTTP3 protocol um, started its, uh, its development and the, fe the features of that UDP-based transport for uh, HTTP, it, um, it was going on and uh, uh, the development on that started even earlier than the release of HTTP2 protocol. Uh, Google with its, um, uh, with its development team was doing a lot of work um, on that. Um, I absolutely agree with, um, with what was uh, said before about um, uh, the, f the features and the reasoning for the HTTP2 um, uh, and how it was developed with the multiplex and priorities features, um, uh, header compression, all of that makes total sense. All of that is very helpful. However, the new features, they do bring a lot of uh, troubles uh, to, uh, to the environment and that's what, what we looked at. Let's see a, f a few uh, interesting graphs here. One, I want to take a look at how much HTTP 3 is used on the web. And right now we're looking at uh, around the quarter of the internet is using, already using the HTTP 3 protocol. 
Um, it is the W3 text graph, or you can ask them how they collect the statistics or if that makes sense for you. Now, I want to ask the audience, like a show of hands, who here uses a CDN um, kind of a, an outside provider, some kind of a shield in front of your servers that you don't have, uh, you, you don't fully own. You use somebody's like Cl Cloudflare's, Akamai's, uh, CloudFront's and others. Yes. And who here does own the actual uh, Nginx server or the actual reverse proxy, the actual box that is looking at the internet? All right. I can see that there is a, a huge split there. And the way how you will be choosing and using the protocols here and what you will be able to do with that depends highly on how you answer to that question. Do you own your actual front end? And in this case, if you look at the, uh, the sites that are uh, shown by the status popular sites using this protocol, you'll see that they actually own their front end fully. They can use that protocol. They can change it. They can do whatever they want. And those of you who uh, raise your hands uh, last, you can also do whatever you want. Okay, here's a side note related to uh, the previous talk about HTTP2. The stats, the usage, the trend is actually falling. Right now, HTTP2 is used less, less and less on the internet. That's going to be more or less uh, my question to you for the discussion zone. Why do you think that is? I honestly don't know. There are some ideas, but I, uh, I don't know why that is happening. So your thoughts there are welcome at the discussion zone. We'll, uh, we'll see how, uh, how that works. <laughs> okay, for HTTP3 protocol, the ability to use the protocol is very high. It is currently supported by all the major uh, browsers. It's not supported by some, by some weird things, some very old browsers and some, uh, some specialty kind of clients. But here's the, here's the question. Is it a browser that is usually the client of your web system? If, this is, if you're actually developing something for the browser, like a website, yes, this is totally applying here. However, if you are developing some kind of uh, mobile app or some API where other systems are your clients, those clients being not the browsers, might choose the protocol and might use the protocol very differently than Chrome, Firefox, or whatever other systems are, are in here. Okay, here's a few conclusions here. HTTP 1 is still an available protocol. And uh, a lot of systems, as I mentioned, those can be weird clients. They can be bots, good or bad. They can be search engines. They, they can be your apps and API clients. They're still HTTP 1 friendly. When you are developing something that is sitting in front of a CDN, your clients are actually that CDN. And if that CDN downgrades to HTTP 1, uh, 2 and 3 is not very much applying. Okay. And then internal connectivity between your servers is very likely to stay on HTTP 1. You, still, you will still keep HTTP 1 on. All right. Let's go at um, uh, a little look on, uh, on the features of HTTP 3 here. And we'll see uh, the major one being the change in the transport layer. And um, as you already know, HTTP 1 and 2, they are all TCP-based protocols. All of the TCP uh, features and TCP problems, that still applies there. Here we are changing the low-level transport to the UDP protocol. There will be a few um, troubles based on that. There will be a few very good things coming from that. Uh, but let's, let's do a little bit of a definition. If, if there would be some kind of uh, a slide I want you uh, to remember for, from this talk, that's going to be the end of this slide. So HTTP 3, it can be described as HTTP 1 semantics over UDP-based quick transport with similar wire format as HTTP 2. All right. That's where you can take a picture if you like. Uh, that, that means a lot, but this is the, uh, the basic description of what we're talking about. We're combining the different versions of the protocols, the good, possibly the good things from those protocols. And we try to put them on the new transport layer, which is that uh, quick transport. 
when we're talking about the support for HTTP 3, there might be a bit of a misunderstanding. What did you mean by quick and what did you mean by HTTP 3? Uh, quick is the system that is providing the ability to put streams, uh, encrypted streams on the network uh, using that basic UDP transport and it provides the connection handling over UDP. HTTP 3 is that HTTP semantic that is using that underlying quick technology. All right, next, uh, further into the features. One of the major things uh, that we were looking at, that is uh, the fast connection establishment that uh, is used and, that, uh, and how we're uh, seeing that in the, um, in the HTTP 3 traffic. Another important, important part is including encryption. If we go back into HTTP 2 protocol, in HTTP 2, somebody will tell you that it is only working with encryption. And if you look at support for HTTP 2 in the browsers, the browsers implemented that with encryption only. However, if you start reading the standards for HTTP 2, you will see that the standard allows using HTTP 2 without encryption. There is the clear text version. However, the browser vendors decided not to implement that, which means regardless if you want or have to use HTTP 2 without encryption, you realistically have to use it with encryption. In HTTP 3, the standard uh, mandates encryption to be in there. All right. Next thing is uh, connection migration. I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. There is a different concept of uh, defining the connection in, uh, in quick uh, compared to how it is defined in TCP. And another talk about uh, head of line blocking. We did, uh, we did see in, in the previous talk that there is a concept of, a, of HTTP head of line blocking. Then there is the concept of TCP head of line blocking. Here in, uh, in Quick, we don't have the TCP layer of head of line blocking. However, in this level, the, uh, the head of line blocking, it, it basically applies, uh, the re retransmission applies only to uh, the frames of one particular stream which means any stream that, I that, is, that was not affected by the lost packets is still continuing to be going. You don't have to establish the full, uh, the full heavy TCP connection. You don't have to uh, maintain the proper packet structure for all of your packets um, at, at, at that's, uh, in that sense. You have to do that per stream, which means only one stream is affected by, uh, by the losses. All right, that should be a very good thing. Um, yes, uh, I don't see a huge problem there, but we'll see a few, if, a few issues that are adding to, uh, the, to the head of line troubles. All right, next, there is an important uh, question on how, how we are defining what the protocol I uh, is and which protocol we are gonna be choosing especially if our client system and server system, they, suppo they support all kinds of protocols. So the selection of that protocol and this negotiation is, a, is an important topic. This is a more or less a practical example here. And uh, one of the major examples of protocol negotiation is our quite standard and quite proper uh, change from HTTP to, H to HTTPS traffic. There is a variety of ways of doing that. And the way we are negotiating that, it can be done on the level of the the protocol with the redirects, like 300 redirects of different kind, or on, e on an even higher layer doing that on the web page itself. That obviously doesn't apply for some API traffics and whatnot. Another way to uh, do the protocol negotiation between HTTP uh, and HTTPS is the strict transport security headers. The, HS the HSTS headers, they define um, that the particular kind of uh, web domain is only going to be accessed by uh, HTTPS and no HTTP. However, this, technically speaking, it is just a suggestion. It is a suggestion for the browsers or for the clients to go with, uh, with that, um, uh, with, with how the header defines it, but it doesn't uh, block you from doing other things. Another way of uh, changing the protocols uh, and um, uh, negotiate a different protocol, it's, a, the, it's the upgrade header. The upgrade header is commonly used for WebSocket traffic, but it doesn't have to be used for just WebSocket. You can uh, change your protocols from HTTP to something else. If you are def uh, defining your, um, your, your own server and client, you can basically use a lot of the functionality of the upgrade header 
to change to whatever other protocol you might be using there. All right, with HTTP 1 to HTTP 2 translation, there is a different story. They both work through the same kind of TCP connection. You are not creating some new connection like from port 80 to port 443, you're, st you're already on the same port 443. Now, how are you gonna tell the, uh, the server and the, basically the server and the client, how are you gonna uh, tell them that it's going to be uh, the particular protocol? And since we are talking about um, uh, encrypted only, I didn't use the word secure, encrypted only uh, traffic for uh, HTTP 2, that protocol negotiation it can be uh, done via the extensions to the encryption uh, process itself. There is a, a thing called uh, TLS extensions, and one of those TLS extensions is called ALPN, Application Layer Protocol Negotiation. Basically, a couple of characters will be sent in the initiation of the, uh, of the handshake, which define which protocols are supported by the client and uh, the server, and that way uh, the higher version of that uh, protocol will be chosen inside of that connection. Okay, once again, we are try trying to establish the encrypted connection. While we're establishing the encrypted connection, we don't know yet what's going to be inside of that connection. So that TLS extension defines what that uh, data is going to be, how it's going to be looking like. Once that is defined, we're sending HTTP 2 data instead of HTTP 1. With HTTP 1 or HTTP 2, uh, the knowledge with, uh, about HTTP 3 protocol is a bit more complicated, once again, because of the UDP traffic. You're not, uh, you're not even establishing a TCP connection, you're not living within the same connection. But the schema is uh, the same, it's still HTTPS from the point of view of the URLs, which means you cannot do the 301 or 302 redirects that we see on, on the top of this slide. Okay, what are, we gonna, what are we gonna do there? There is a standard that defines a header called the uh, Alternative Service uh, ALTSVC header. Uh, it has a special format which defines the versions of, uh, of the protocol or basically alternative protocols. And then you can tell the browsers or compliant clients how, are you, uh, how they are gonna be connected and through, through which version of the protocol they're gonna be connected uh, depending on what you want them to do. You can define that as an alternate, alternate port or even some domain name with a port up to you. In the official standard, you can use any port you like. Realistically, you won't, because, well, on the public internet, uh, you don't use weird ports. So we, uh, we have a bunch of weird firewalls on the way, your uh, local networks sometimes not liking some weird ports. And uh, the general recommendation is to use port 443 for that kind of connectivity, basically keep the same port. It's gonna be a UDP port 443 now, not TCP port. Um, so when you're looking through your Netstat uh, connect, uh, connectivity to, to the connections, uh, to, the, to the open ports, you, uh, you will see uh, uh, that one differently. All right, let's go a little further in the protocol internals. Inside the protocol, we were, uh, we were talking before that we have um, the faster connection establishment. Here's a simple diagram that shows uh, how that's looking where uh, we're using uh, the older TCP-based protocol or uh, HTTP request over quick. And right here, oh, we're seeing that we're able to send uh, the, uh, the data, the, uh, the request data, straight up, basically in the first, uh, in the first datagram. There is, a, there is a bit of caveats of knowing uh, some uh, uh, of knowing the details about that um, uh, certificate and, uh, and establishing some, uh, uh, some connectivity there. But you can significantly faster get to the first real bit of protocol data um, compared to using the TCP-based protocol in this case. <coughs> Here's a, a list of standards that are related to QUIC and HTTP3. And, um, oh, a few of those, they, uh, they are related to the quick transport layer, and HTTP 3 on, uh, on top of that is just, uh, just one of the standards. And the very, uh, there is another very important thing that, that is defined as a standard called uh, QPAC. That is uh, the, uh, the way of compressing fields for HTTP 3. That uh, field compression is um, a very interesting story. I'm, uh, I'm going to stop on that um, as a... Um, 
as, as a separate uh, separate bit of topic here. Uh, first, we'll talk about uh, the uh, the packet routing functionality that is uh, that is defined there. And remember, I talked before that we uh, have a different ways of defining what the client is. Normally, in uh, the TCP-based connectivity, you have uh, the tuple of uh, um, outgoing IP address and port and incoming um, uh, address and port. Here, for, th for the sake of this protocol, we have the, uh, the concept called connection ID. And that connection ID is not a part of an IP address or port of that client. The client's, uh, the, uh, the same connection ID might be landing on the server from different uh, IP addresses, from different ports, from different mediums. The server is supposed to take the, uh, those different bits of data and combine them and figure out where connection ID is the same. This is more complicated for the web server developer because we, don't, uh, we cannot just easily rely on the operating system to tell us where that particular socket belongs. There is no such concept anymore. We have to bring it further up into the, uh, um, in, into the application stack and deal with that on the software layer of the application server, not giving that to the operating system kernel. And that's, uh, that's why we, uh, we cannot do just simple reuse port there. We have to use uh, eBPF in order to do that effectively on, um, uh, on the web server development uh, portion. <coughs> Uh, another thing that uh, this uh, concept of connection ID provides is the possibility, potential possibility for client migration. An example of client migration, which I've never seen in practice yet, is when you are downloading something and you're walking outside of this building and your Wi-Fi disappears, you're starting to go through your 4G or 5G connection. In the ideal world, uh, with this concept, you will still be sending the same, the same connection ID and that same client um, would be transferred from one physical media of uh, Wi-Fi into another physical media of 4G, possibly without problem. Once again, haven't seen that in practice yet. I hope that will show up some, uh, at some point in life. All right. Next, we were talking about uh, the fact that HTTP 3 shows the similar wire format as HTTP 2. Well, that means it has streams. And HTTP 3 uh, has a number of uh, bidirectional client streams where the normal data flows. However, there are some special streams, and one of those is related to header compression with that QPAC um, al uh, algorithm which encodes and decodes the, uh, the header data. Bef basically, before going into the details on how that QPAC stream works, we'll take a, a further look into the HTTP 1 request and how it looks decoded in HTTP 3 or for the same reason, HTTP 2. In HTTP 1, we have the thing called a request line. This is that first top line of the HTTP request, which says uh, get with the URLs, versions of the protocol, and so on. That particular line, it shows, um, uh, it shows you how um, how you're defining the, uh, the parts which are not, uh, that those parts are not in the headers of the request, they're before the headers. In the HTTP 2 and 3, those um, items, they're called pseudo headers. And those pseudo headers, they are defined the same way as other headers are defined. Basically, instead of uh, defining, uh, the same way as you're defining the header for cookie, the same way there is a pseudo header for the URL which in HTTP 1 was not a header at all. It was a part of the request line. That's a bit of a difference, but that provides more consistency between the pieces of data that we need to provide uh, between the server and the client, regardless of what, what, what kind of data that is. All right, same way as uh, HPAC for HTTP 2, we have the similar idea with HTTP 3 for the field compression. Now that we know that uh, the fields there, they can, they can contain uh, the, the URL, the method, and the other headers, those, uh, uh, those items, they are defined in a static table of 99 very commonly used kind of uh, headers. And then there is a, a thing called dynamic table. Okay, 
Uh, static table is pretty much easily understood. There is just a list. It is well known between all clients and all servers what that list is. We're not changing that at all. Those are well-known headers. Very, very simple. For the dynamic table, there is a difference between HTTP2 and HTTP3 because HTTP2 fills up the dynamic compression table based on the traffic that's going through the, uh, that particular connection. So when the traffic is going through, you're filling that in dynamically. In HTTP 3, you can pre-fill that data outside of that actual connection. That kind of looks like server push. <laughs> is that a good thing? All right, here's another, uh, here's a more a concrete example here. And uh, this is where we are setting up um, the, uh, the dynamic table in the different stream from where the actual request and response will, uh, will be created. That can be done basically out of band from where that uh, actual request will happen. If your server knows uh, what requests uh, to expect from the client, you can basically pre-fill that data. Now, in the request stream, uh, once the data was, uh, was filled in, you only need to reference it. And here, in this example, uh, the data on the left is equal to the amount of data, uh, is equal to the data on the right in terms of uh, how, uh, how protocol puts, uh, puts it on the network. This is the example of compression here. You might think uh, it, this is the compression through encoding and decoding using that, uh, that kind of table. This is a very significant amount of compression. Now, when that makes sense and when th that actually doesn't make sense, if you have uh, content-heavy workloads, let's, let's say huge videos, longer files, some big things that, the, uh, that your clients are requesting, you actually don't care that much about uh, header compression because the headers will be the minimal um, amount compared to the huge amount of those files that you're transferring. However, if your workload is uh, similar to some API-heavy chatting applications, you might see a kilobyte of headers for the reason of sending a couple of bytes of data as the response to your APIs. And if you're doing that all the time, those huge kilobytes of data, they are uh, adding up to some um, unnecessary traffic on the network. Okay, but here's the question. If, you're, if you have an API-heavy application, are your clients actually the browsers that, that can use the HTTP 3? Or those clients are HTTP 1 clients where this cannot apply at all? That's a fair question. <laughs> and now we're getting to the challenges of, um, uh, this, um, um, of this protocol. And this is a very, a very similar idea that you saw about HTTP 2. The same concept applies. This kind of picture where you have the client and the server and nothing else in between is great when you're just developing that application, but in the real world, it is uh, more like that. You are likely to have a reverse proxy in the middle and then have some, some connectivity to the back, and that's uh, inherently going to be uh, HTTP 1. Well, and more likely, the real world architecture looks like that. It is, it is a little bit frustrating to, to deal with these things, and um, some, sometimes we have to. The major thing about uh, this number of boxes, uh, it's, uh, it's just a, 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 bunch of, a bunch of things from Visio, like system I, uh, I put on there. It's, um, it was too frustrating to look at the real ones. One of the major things is, uh, is here in the middle. It says, boxes are not yours. A even if you own the, the front end box, there is a possibility that there is a bunch of boxes somewhere in the middle. There can be something on the client side and if your client, once again, is not a browser, that also applies that, that you're, you don't uh, own that part of the client. Okay. Now, um, another, uh, another item that is very important here is that UDP-based protocols, well, uh, the systems are not, uh, the, the web systems, they are not designed to handle UDP well. Everything for the last uh, few decades was focusing a lot on TCP optimizations, on how TCP should be working for, for the web. And now we're applying the concept of enabling UDP traffic on, those, uh, on, on the larger internet entities. That 
relates with the very last item on the slides, that um, the negotiation into the HTTP3 protocol and keeping the protocol specifically H3 is a very fragile concept. If something is broken on your UDP layer anywhere between the client and the server, you might have a, a problem of uh, fallback, basically back to your HTTP2 and HTTP1 from what you thought is going to be the lifesaver and the greatest thing ever. Okay, that means that when you are designing the sizing of the system and the sizing of your network, you still have to account for uh, the, uh, the ability for the network to fall back from that protocol. Um, okay, that's just, uh, that's just something to consider. There is also a set of tooling challenges there. And um, I will disagree with the previous speaker. According to the question that, what I, that was asked from the audience, that uh, there is a holy war between the binary protocols and plain text protocols. I will assert that plain text protocols are better because when we are developing something based on those protocols, we can read that as humans, use it on Telnet, use the easier Wireshark or some TCP dumps, we are able to read what's going on. However, when the protocol becomes encrypted and heavily binary, it's hard for us, uh, for the humans to troubleshoot it without using the complicated um, debug tools, the complicated set of uh, features that allow to decode that kind of protocol into the human readable form, and then you're dealing with a plain text version. Now, how do those tools work? That's the, that's the very, uh, very significant thing there, because uh, we're, start, we're starting to, uh, to get those tools, uh, some, um, uh, there are methods to get proper debug data from that, uh, for, for, the, for the debugging of that binary protocol. But it's, it is still significantly more complicated when you're dealing with uh, the real life uh, issues there, with the real life problems. The same applies to the visibility and monitoring, and also applies to the visibility and monitoring of uh, uh, your protocol through the third parties. The third parties, uh, as uh, your CDN providers, uh, uh, some local, uh, local proxies and others, they now have less visibility on what's going on th with the network, uh, primarily because of that UDP traffic instead of understandable TCP connections. All right. There is also a set of security challenges. To that, we will have to see how that uh, develops uh, in our life. But there is a thing about uh, UDP protocol not being trusted by many internet entities. Has it ever happened to you when we, you go to a coffee shop, connect to a Wi-Fi, and you only have TCP traffic and not UDP? There is, uh, except maybe 50, 53 ports for DNS, but even that one has its own set of problems. All right, there is um, uh, also that same problem of uh, designing the security devices on all the security levels, uh, on all of those um, CDNs, application firewalls, on uh, DDoS protection features. That uh, concept of understanding that, uh, that traffic very deeply, it still applies. All right, now that we, uh, that we looked at that, we'll see a, a bit of the practical data of how you can configure it if you so choose. If you don't, oh great, I see a couple of people leaving. They don't want this protocol. That's awesome. <laughs> that actually makes total sense. Uh, yes. So the way, the way to, con uh, to configure this, um, uh, this protocol, it, uh, you can uh, use it right now in the mainline packages of Nginx. We finally released it. It was a huge, painful, and long process to do that with the experimental source available for uh, some, something like a, uh, about a year. But now we, uh, we finished merging that into the mainline branch. OK, so I'm saying here that there are packages available. However, there are some limitations. It's not possible for us, or basically for anyone for the, for the same reason, to build HTTP3 friendly servers on older Linux distros. Because of that embedded encryption, we have to use the newer SSL libraries in order to compile the encryption into, uh, into the system correctly. And those old distros, they will not be supported. I'm not listing them intentionally, because uh, some of you might be, uh, uh, might be looking through this video a year from now. You might remember something half a year from now. The list of distros and what's considered new today is going to be different from this moment in time when, uh, when you're looking through this information. 
Now, when you're compiling it for Nginx, the main feature that you will see in the uh, dash capital V, or uh, the same if, if, if you're compiling it yourself, that's going to be a dash dash with HTTP v3 module. And there will be more, uh, there will be more configure parameters that are defining which encryption library you're using with, the, with, this, uh, kind of pro uh, with this protocol, uh, for this protocol. Uh, how to check for that? The newer, newer versions of Nginx have the variable HTTP3 that you can use in log format and uh, see that in the logs however you want. Or you can even use that variable for some, some logic that you can apply to the config. Now, when you're looking uh, at, uh, at Nginx conf, there is a couple of things here that, um, uh, that I will show. Uh, for, uh, for the HTTP 3 to enable it uh, correctly, you take your listener and you enable uh, the parameter called quick and the parameter you use port. Now, if you configured Nginx uh, some time uh, before, you will notice that I have another directive here called HTTP 2, and I set it to on. In the very recent version of Nginx, we moved HTTP2 parameter outside of the listen, uh, listener socket and put it in the server block, which means now we're able to define which server block will support HTTP2 and which will not. Before, you were only defining that for the whole entirety of the socket. Now it is server-based. All right, uh, in, the, in this, uh, basically the slash location of those servers, you have to add uh, the, uh, the alternative service header, as we defined it with, uh, as we discussed it, um, for the negotiation of the protocol, and this is uh, this is where you're you're doing that. This is uh, fairly simple. SSL certificate and key, they are basically the same. Uh, you should you you must use those uh, for proper configuration of this protocol. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, at the defaults here, and uh, in the defaults, how, when you are configuring Nginx in a very simple form and not setting up anything. Let's, uh, let's see how to read this slide. This is a bit more complicated. Uh, the listen directive with a port, it will not, by default, enable quick and reuse port, which means if you want HTTP 3, you, can, uh, you, uh, you must use the quick and reuse port parameters for listen directive. OK, so for the HTTP 2, the default for that directive is off. Which means, uh, once again, you're setting up your, uh, your server with a simple listen 443 um, uh, SSL and whatnot. Your HTTP2 will not be immediately and by default enabled. We're, we're not doing that. Now, HTTP3 directive, the default is on. The default for the directive is on. However, the listen socket doesn't have the quick transport for HTTP3, which means effectively by default it will be disabled. Now, when you are configuring uh, um, Nginx with the listen 443 quick reuse port, uh, you, uh, that means you don't have to define HTTP3 as a separate directive. Let's go back into this slide. On this slide, you don't see HTTP3 as anything enabled here. You're enabling it by default by enabling quick and reuse port on the listener socket. But for some servers where you don't want it, you can disable it by using HTTP3 off if they're using the same, uh, the same sockets there. All right, so we went, we went through the defaults there. Uh, that, uh, once again, I do recommend to use HTTP2 and HTTP3 um, variables and see that in the logs on how that is actually going through the network. Are those clients actually connecting to you through this, this version of the protocol? And uh, it is important for us, uh, for us to know how, uh, how it works and, uh, uh, and collect the percentages data, the, uh, the actual benefits that you might have from the protocol. It's very important to do that, those visibility checks. All right, so I'm getting to the end of uh, this lengthy presentation. And um, unfortunately, it's not very straightforward. I honestly don't know if I if I look at uh, at, at any system here if if we we talk I I honestly don't know I, I cannot recommend to use HTTP three everywhere in the world. I cannot always say that it is bad. It is helpful in some cases, and uh, what we were trying to do here is to give you some context on how to choose the protocol versions, the whole, the all permutations of the protocol versions of between one, two, and three, uh, however, uh, that actually fits in, uh, in your network. So um, 
uh, another thing to, uh, to mention, a very, very important part, is that uh, you need to test it well. And when you are developing the system where you're just connecting from your client or your, your browser straight to the machine, straight to the server, that's not the test that I'm talking about. When you enable that through the actual infrastructure that's going through uh, the entirety of the boxes in between, this is, where, um, uh, this is where the proper test applies. And that also includes the, uh, the test for the clients, or for those clients which are browsers, for those clients which you don't control and they will always use HTTP 1, or for those clients that you will write yourself for however you want to use that protocol in those clients. All right, and the last item here is prepare for unknown. This is a new thing. We don't have a lot of data on how it will actually be used in, the, uh, in practice. This is basically it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. You brought some fireworks <laughs> from home. <laughs> Let's ask questions, please. Raise your hands. Uh, first row, second row here. Let's start here real quick, please. Uh, hello, my name is Alexander. Thank you for a great report. I want to ask, does uh, HTTP3 support a mutual TLS connection? Uh, mutual TLS connection, uh, in, that, in that sense, you mean uh, the client certificates or something else? Uh, yeah, yeah, like uh, client certificates and like the connection with server side, yes, client. I, n I never checked it on the client certificates. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I will have to get back to you on that. I honestly don't know it. Mm -hmm. you're, current, you're currently in the lead for the best question since I don't <laughs> know the answer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Over here, please, uh, on the first row here. Hello, thank you for your report. Uh, so, uh, during your report, you mentioned some uh, benefits and examples, uh, such as uh, migration, and uh, also your, you mentioned example when uh, you move from your home to a uh, coffee shop. Uh, but uh, in such cases, many times uh, they have their own hardware, maybe they, it, is, it is not uh, updated uh, mm -hmm. that often. Um, how realistically do you think it is uh, for worldwide uh, infrastructure, especially on the side of uh, maybe small businesses where, your, where actual people uh, use uh, internet it to upgrade um, enough so that uh, the features HTTP 3 uh, br brings are uh, actually uh, enabled. Mm -hmm. how, how soon do you think it will actually work? That's, uh, that is a very, very good question, and you're basically bridging the two points of the presentation that I made. One is that there is the functionality that is defined in the protocol. It is theoretically and academically beautiful. But in the real world, you have a bunch of boxes in the middle and a bunch of people who configure those boxes in an even more weird way. And you're not controlling that, that part of the infrastructure. How long will it, will it take? Uh, realistically thinking, let's, uh, let's take some kind of uh, some calculations, uh, which uh, you should not hold me to that a few years later. Uh, let, uh, let's, uh, let's see if, um, if the providers of those boxes will um, go and start uh, implementing all of that functionality. It will take them at least, let's say, a couple of years, a few years to implement that correctly in all of those consumer level boxes. Now, we will look at the lifetime of those boxes in the wild, which can easily be five years, 10 years, something like that. And once, uh, once we get to that point, when all of that will be updated with the newer boxes, provided that the creators of those boxes actually listened to the promise of HTTP 3 and believed it and, uh, and thought that it's going to be the best thing for the world, maybe in about a decade we will see uh, that, kind of, that kind of functionality. But maybe we will never see that because uh, we don't know if we're going to ever see something like HTTP 4 or some other uh, physical mediums or maybe people will abandon that just as people abandon server push. Next question, please. 
Yeah, because you're saying about controlling uh, the infrastructure. Doesn't that mean that the uh, transition to HTTP3 can start first from the edge servers, your reverse proxies, then to, to your logic servers? So enabling HTTP3 there first because you have much more control. Uh, that is absolutely correct. If you are owning the front level of your infrastructure, if you are the actual owner of that reverse proxy in front, that makes absolute sense to use it. But when somebody from the new security department comes in and says that you must use this application firewall in front of what you own, then that box needs to, uh, to do that. Then you will have to put your, uh, another box in front of that box and kind of move the, the, that item that supports the protocol well uh, further and further to the edge of your environment. If you're able to do that, yes, you're absolutely right. That's, that's where you should start supporting it. But uh, if there is an, um, some kind of mandate, the security requirements, some uh, networking requirement which prevents you from owning in the front edge, then, uh, well, you're not in, in huge luck of using this protocol at all. Next question, please. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we can pick any port on the server side for the HTTP free uh, quick protocol, however, in practice, if somebody does decide to use some other port, uh, wouldn't that fall apart because the client or the browser would expect port for free? Do we need to have like negotiation on HTTP2 or can we use some uh, higher level like DNS to tell it on what port to expect? This is a very, uh, you're making a very good point there. Uh, it is important to understand that, uh, that the old service header, which is the official way of negotiating the HTTP3 protocol, has no option for same port you must provide a number. When you are providing that number, it is equally the same uh, for um, all, all of those ports. They're equally the same from the point of view of the protocol negotiation. We, uh, where I will say that it makes sense, to, why it will, it will make sense to use port 443, because it is more likely that your local coffee shop with that Wi-Fi access point will allow you to use port 443, and it is very likely that that coffee shop will disable weird ports. Uh, however, if you're doing this uh, inside, in, inside of some, some of your own networks, where you, where you are inside of your intranet, where you can do whatever you want, there might be cases when port 443 UTP is busy with something else. And we're going to have a talk further in the conference about WebRTC. And WebRTC is another example when, when we're using the same port, uh, where you will have to choose something else for HTTP 3. Um, once again, very, very valid points. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question here. Uh, thanks, Nick, for your presentation. Uh, are there any known scenarios or specific high load use cases where HTTP2 outperforms HTTP3 in terms of overall performance metrics? If so, what factors contribute to this and what are the trade offs between the protocols in such situ situations? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, we don't have uh, the uh, the ideal um, comparison scenario uh, because uh, the, uh, there are different kinds of traffic, and this is very this is significantly different from what kind of uh, loads you're you're taking. There is even uh, there is even a test between HTTP two and HTTP one, which shows how HTTP one can be significantly faster than HTTP three. Uh, than HTTP two, uh, because HTTP two is uh, is not very much like like in the jitter in the traffic and packet loss. However, HTTP one, uh, when when you have uh, multiple connections, uh, if you have that uh, that weird packet loss, it might actually recover better per connection instead of using that in one connection. For HTTP three, uh, we don't have the data yet. Uh, I'm, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a good point to look into that for the, uh, for the further years and the further conferences when this is more wide, uh, wide stream adopted by, by you and by us. Okay, this is going to be a scary one because uh, this guy has a blue badge, so he's a speaker <laughs> as well. Uh, be gentle. Oh, I will, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Nick, thanks a lot for your report. Uh, very interesting. And you have mentioned at one point uh, a uh, a feature of HTTP3, which is actually rooted in Quick, uh, about opening new streams uh, whenever uh, the client, as we may define him, uh, changes the location, changes uh, the Wi-Fi network from mobile network, and so on. So uh, this is, 
I think in RFC they call it the linkability resistance of Quick, like uh, adding new connection IDs and client IDs whenever something is slightly changing, and this might this might even happen uh, from the same device at the same IP address when, for example, a new component of the client side application opens a new connection to the backend. So lots of things, and uh, the problem that I'd like to you to consider is. Uh, the connection tables for the purposes of load balancing and other stuff, and I'm not even talking about DDoS mitigation here, uh, looks like for Quick and HTTP3 uh, in high load, we need vastly bigger connection tables, means more memory, and the current uh, Quick and HTTP3 implementation libraries are very CPU heavy in comparison to what we have by now in the old protocol stack. So with all, all these things in mind, how do you think, are we ready globally for HTTP3 migration, or do we need uh, the more slow to take effect and wait for a couple of new hardware cycles, uh, hardware production cycles, in order for the infrastructure to catch up with the new requirements? I think uh, I think another um, another cycle for the hardware will be very much needed for the for the overall internet to understand quick correctly. I absolutely agree with the, with some of the larger connection tables and with the understanding of the concept of uh, of uh, connection ID instead of those uh, IP addresses. It uh, there is more uh, there is more to go. However, when uh, when you're looking at your own infrastructure, uh, usually the uh, the main part of the load in many cases is in the backend logic. If you're using the same kind of hardware for the front end and network devices as you're using for your uh, back end load, you're able to carve out resources differently between those types of hardware. And uh, if you're using some, some specialized har hardware, some of those uh, old Cisco routers or some of those uh, F5 boxes and whatever other things uh, could be the actual physical specialty boxes. For those, uh, the, the physical upgrade or some significant firmware, uh, firmware updates might be actually needed. Mm -hmm. I am sorry, we're out of time. So please grab the speaker and the discussion zone right outside the hall. He will answer all the other questions in any language you suggest. So, who gets the prize? Uh, un uh, unusually, <laughs> that will the first the first question because my my answer to that was I don't know. <laughs> that was a very good question. You got me there. <laughs> if you could wave to the helpers. Thank you, Nick. It was a great presentation. Uh,